is part of the Bibbulmun track, named to commemorate the Aborigines who traditionally owned and utilised this particular environment. Stretches some 500 kilometres from Kalamunda through to Albany. The original Bibbulmun lived in the extreme southwest of this area. They once lived on a variety of bush and animal foods, such as kangaroos, fish and edible roots, taking only enough for their immediate needs. They used the forest to obtain food, sometimes travelling with a smouldering fire stick with which to burn the bush, to uh, renew pasture and to help catch animals. Otherwise, it remained unchanged. Great stands of trees, which stood for centuries. Leaves might look insignificant, however they have a vital function. When in sunlight, all green parts of a plant help provide us with air. Through the process of photosynthesis, they take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and change it into food for themselves to grow. At the same time, they release oxygen, which you and I can breathe. Thereby, they provide a balance, because we inhale oxygen, and breathe out carbon dioxide. The sun initiates photosynthesis, which is the essential key to the whole life process on Earth, not just plants themselves. It's the sun's energy that provides the impetus for trees to grow. Down here on the darker forest floor, the soil holds the water and mineral nutrients ready to be absorbed by the tree's roots. Let's look further. All living things, trees and animals, coexist within the forest environment in a mutually beneficial way. They are all part of an ecosystem. All the components are related, they're interdependent. Animals and birds use the forest vegetation for food, shelter and nesting. Otherwise they couldn't survive. In turn, they help distribute seeds and pollinate tree flowers. Plants and animals die and provide litter. And this matter decomposes, providing the soil with nutrients that are taken up through the root system. This nutrient flow is one of the cycles operating within the forest. Then there are human beings. They have a right to coexist with the forest too. They're a crucial element, a major force in the forest's destiny. It's impossible to move through the bush without disturbing something, without leaving some evidence behind. And some people aren't as careful isn't that so? And of course we need picnic areas, even complete with barbecues.
You got a bun for me? Thanks a lot. However, if they tread carefully and use enough foresight, then the intrusion can often be justified. People must eat. In fact, there's a nation to be fed and money to be made on the international market by exporting agricultural produce. Therefore, land must be cleared and wheat grown or sheep and cattle grazed. Picturesque, isn't it? However, it's not a natural landscape. Original stands of timber have been decimated, trees pushed over and piled into heat, ready to be burned. The land is cleared of original vegetation and grain sown, or pasture and grasses planted. These agricultural activities, grasses, the plough and grazing animals compete with the forests. Another environmental result is that there aren't enough trees in these landscapes for natural regeneration. And certainly not enough original vegetation for fauna to survive in their native ecological niches. Through land clearance, farmers have upset the natural balance, severely modifying the landscape to enable agricultural production. A modification required to support a productive economic landscape. This area is dead. Salt has killed it. Once there were native trees here with deep, strong roots reaching to the water table below. Clearing of land has been rash. The original forest has been removed uphill from here and replaced by farmland. Crops have shallow roots and take up far less water. Land without vegetation is at the mercy of the elements. No roots to hold the soil together. It's left to the ravages of wind and rain. Of course, the salt invades the rivers as well. When the Noongar Aborigines roamed this area, living off the country, the river was clean and fresh. The Swan, the Murray and the Blackwood have similar problems. Too salty because of the rising water table and salt finds its way to the major rivers of the southwest. It's crucial that places of large settlement and intensive land use have access to permanent water supplies. Water from here is used to irrigate farmland as far away as Bunbury and also supplies the Harvey Waruna irrigation system and the towns of the great southern inland region. There are salt problems in the catchment area, in the streams that feed the Wellington Dam. The predominant cause for the increase in stream salinity is the permanent clearing for agriculture in the upper catchment areas away from the dam itself. The problem streams are further inland in the higher and drier areas. Government restrictions on the clearance of land is enforced and reforestation programs are underway on repurchased farmland in the Wellington and other catchments. This policy is designed to slow down stream salinity increase caused by agricultural land clearance. 
you can't create a forest overnight. There is a time gap. Today, we're more aware of the problems. Current philosophy is that wholesale clearing of land is to be avoided, although clear felling still occurs. The Bibblemen had their fire stick farming, putting forest areas to the torch, then watched a natural regeneration. They influenced the composition of the forest as we know it today. Today, clear felling is used as a system of forest management. Mature carry trees are removed from an area and replaced by seedlings. The seedlings have a high demand for light. They do not tolerate shade. So it's necessary to remove all the mature trees in the area to allow the forest to successfully regenerate. But what sort of forest is it that just has the one age of trees? Will it support the wildlife that normally uses old, dead trees? Are we making the forest into a, a less diverse ecosystem, more like a farm than a forest? The ultimate results of clear felling are unknown. Nurseries are established to raise eucalypts for many purposes. Reforestation on farmland, rehabilitation of mined areas, regeneration of carry areas where not enough seed is regenerated. Pines are also grown and their plantations are now a common site. Pines take about 30 years to mature. They provide a commercial basis for cheap homegrown softwood, timber that's replacing the reduced cut of hardwood. Not really indigenous fauna. They're part of a commercial enterprise called agroforestry. Here, farmers use the land for a combined investment. Trees are grown alongside animals, or sometimes crops. Economic profit results from both sources. Therefore, the strategy requires sound land management. However, agroforestry is still new, and there's much to learn. Pioneers were deceived by the height, girth, and the quantity of trees they found. They assumed that there must be ample surface water. It was a gross misunderstanding. The size and greenness of our forest is due to the climatic adaptations trees have made in poor soils. These laterite soils are poor by anyone's standards. The caprock and the red gravel was of little value to potential farmers. The pebbles, which the early settlers thought useless, provide the raw material for aluminium. They're the mineral bauxite, a valuable mining discovery. Within the catchment areas are some of the finest young stands of Jarrah. And underneath lie good quality deposits of bauxite. The result? is a conflict of interest over the resources. You may have heard some of the arguments. for bauxite cover most of the northern Jarrah forest. No species of tree will adequately replace Jarrah and the native ecosystem is lost forever. 
Money from the mining industry and royalties are helping to pay scientists and other experts to build up a bank of knowledge about the hills, trees, water, wildlife and minerals that no government can afford. He stated that the royalty for export of alumina was low and at least half of the annual profits go overseas. Mining earns money, which is used to develop the state. The world needs aluminium. There's a growing demand. The industry is power hungry. The refinery consumes 20% of the state's fossil fuels. It's an energy intensive operation at a time when liquid and gas fuels are increasingly scarce. In short, the red mud residue can be successfully used to help rescue wasteland areas. It's cheap and it's easy to mine. The bauxite is close to the surface, the site is near ports and a workforce, and a reforestation program the is National operating. News from the ABC, read by and there are some areas so affected by dieback that they're beyond rehabilitation, and mining is possibly spreading the disease. <laughs> This is a section of dead forest, caused by the disease known as Jarrah dieback, or root rot. It's so widespread that evidence of dieback has been discovered in orchards, garden nurseries, and even backyards of homes. A microscopic soil-borne fungus is the cause of the problem. It causes damage by attacking the root systems. Jarrah depends on deep vertical roots for water and these are often girdled by the fungus thus cutting off the tree's water supply. Eventually the diseased tree is left airing naked limbs bleaching under the sun. It doesn't just attack Jarrah. Banksias are the most prone. Black boy trees, zamia palms and casuarinas are also badly affected. Government research officers have stations where the soil environments are monitored and the susceptibility of different vegetation types to the fungus are analysed. It's hoped that the disease can be controlled in the short term by forest hygiene, as artificial or man-made spreading of the fungus is a major problem. Large quantities of diseased soil were moved by a bulldozer to assist with road building. However, this spread dieback. So did mining operations. The fungus is easily carried on the wheels of bikes, trucks and machinery. production is still a viable economic concern. Timber is needed for building houses, furniture, and many other uses like pulp for paper. So regeneration and reforestation programs are integral parts of the whole wood milling industry.
what would you do? There's timber, water supply, recreation, agriculture, conservation and mining to consider. Now, these land uses are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Some do have compatibility. But which should take priority? What form of land use is best for our state and our future in both the long and short term? Any recommendations on the use of forest as a multiple resource is going to be something of a compromise. All forest users have a point of view. Which decision should be made? After all, it's your forest. <laughs>